From the sand-covered wastes of Abydos to the treacherous inner circle of the Sanctum Tower, I absolutely adore the story of Blue Archive. If you've ever wanted to learn more about the world of Blue Archive from someone who is more than a little obsessed with this game, then I invite you to join me in exploring the lore of Blue Archive. It should go without saying that I will be delving into extensive spoilers for the game, so if you haven't completed the following stories, I would highly suggest doing so. This particular video will include spoilers for the Foreclosure Task Force, as well as Total Assault b -Naw. That being said, if you're okay with spoilers and you still want to watch, please feel free to do so. I've tried to make this video as accessible as possible, so even with minimal knowledge of the game, it should still be a fun ride for anyone who likes lore deep dives. Without further ado, welcome to the first episode of Lore Archive. In an effort to make this series as engaging as possible, I have written this video to be less of a lecture and more of a story. This first volume of Lore Archive will weave together the major events within Abydos, as well as my deductions for how this all fits together within the world of the game. Because the main story is told somewhat out of order, I have reorganized some of the events to try and better explain the full context of everything that transpires. When all is said and done, this lore archive video will be part audio drama and part Kiroto's history lesson, but I hope it will be fun to listen to. If the word count is anything to go by, this video will be tremendously long, so please enjoy it at your own pace and feel free to come back to it as you like. I'll be leaving lots of timestamps throughout the video, so you can find your place if you need to return to this later. By the end of this video, my hope is that you'll have a better understanding of Kivotos, the plight of Abydos Academy, and the sinister forces that seek to overturn the balance of power in the city. With my preamble now out of the way, I hope that you enjoy this first volume of the Lore Archive Anthology. Our story takes place in Kivotos, an academy city so tremendously large it would be better to call it a country. Within this gigantic city country, most of the populace are students who all share a strange characteristic, these peculiar halos. The halos have some rather interesting properties. In addition to having a unique shape for every student, they also massively reduce damage taken from a variety of weapons, including gunfire, mortar shells, and even rail guns. As a result, the students here are considerably more blasé about violence and tend to settle disputes with gunfire over diplomacy. It comes as no surprise then that the halo-wearing students of this city hold all the physical and political power. Each academy literally owns and controls the land within their own districts, including taking rent payments from store owners who operate within academy limits. Laws within each district are laid down by that school's representative student council, and some academies even enforce laws with academy-sponsored militia comprised of particularly strong students. All these different academies are presided over by the General Student Council, the highest-ranking student organization within Kivotos. They operate independently from any individual school, and they are the ultimate law of the land within this city. Districts may have their own individual regulations, but the General Student Council are the final authorities on how Kivotos business is conducted. The General Student Council presides over Kivotos within the Sanctum Tower, a tremendous building that towers into the sky from all corners of the city. At the top of the General Student Council is the President, who holds, um, rather large amounts of authority over Kivotos, even amongst her peers. To simplify this a bit, let's think of Kivotos again as a country. The General Student Council President would be the president of this country, and all the General Student Council officers would be her cabinet. All the different academies would be different states or provinces within that country, 
with their student councils serving as governors and state lawmakers, and their militia being state-sponsored militia. This comparison isn't completely perfect, as some of the schools aren't quite large enough to be on the same level as a state, but it's a close enough comparison to explain how much power all these academies and councils have within Kivotos. Whatever land isn't taken by individual academies is directly controlled by the General Student Council, leading to large corridors of essentially federally controlled land that runs between different academies. As an aside, the General Student Council does have their own federal militia, but we're going to leave that topic for a later video. Although it may be more approachable to think of Kivotos in terms of cabinets and governors, it's important to remember that the students here can and do settle matters violently. And more importantly, the students themselves are the ultimate authority here. This city, which effectively functions as a large country, is entirely run by students. All the students take classes without teachers, they learn from Blu-rays and tactical training books, and live in dormitories or private housing within the city. Some have siblings within the city, but no one ever seems to talk about their families or parents beyond that. The entire situation is eerie, to say the least. The students have taken on a tremendous amount of responsibility, and although they do their best to run this gargantuan city, there are cracks that are beginning to appear within this peculiar world. This is not to say that adults don't exist at all in this world, just that few of them seem to be humanoid. All of the shops and underlying infrastructure of the world is run by adults, who are either robots or animals, none of which have halos. Consequently, their safety is directly guaranteed by the halo-wearing students, and they pay taxes and rent to the student councils of their respective districts. Notably, no robots or animals have any representation within the student councils of their own districts, much less the general student council. The seats of the diplomatic table of Kivotos are reserved for the students with halos and no one else. If this all feels rather ominous, then that's a good instinct to have. Even at the best of times, the General Student Council has difficulty preventing violence between different academies. And with the students holding all the physical and political power within Kivotos, the discontent of those without this power can only continue to grow. With the dystopian ingredients of our story prepared, we now have the necessary pieces to tell the tale of how Kivotos' largest school fell to ruin, and how a corporate opportunist, an eldritch organization, and a selfless teacher all raced to pick up the pieces. On yet another chaotic day within the city of halo-wearing students, a peculiar occurrence took place. A halo-less adult human, simply called Sensei, woke up in the General Student Council Hall with hazy recollections of a war-torn world and a plea for help from the General Student Council President. Upon waking, Sensei finds that the president is nowhere to be found, leaving Kivotos and the General Student Council in a sense of disarray. The General Student Council officers were hurriedly trying to maintain a sense of authority within the city, but their access to the Sanctum Tower, their main hub and power within the city, had been mysteriously revoked leading to further confusion amongst their ranks. The sudden appearance of Sensei further threw a wrench in the General Student Council, as no one knew or understood how Sensei even came to Kivotos. Arriving from outside Kivotos, it would seem, is increasingly difficult, if not outright impossible under normal circumstances. Despite her absence, the president clearly anticipated Sensei's appearance, 
as she left behind clear orders that Sensei not only be treated with respect, but that they be granted leadership of a brand new extrajudicial club by the name of Shale, the Independent Federal Investigation Club. This new club would be associated with the General Student Council, but ultimately have tremendous authority to interact with schools all over Kivotos and conduct investigations independently of the General Student Council. Such a club existing at all would raise quite a few eyebrows within Kivotos, but the fact that it would be led by an adult, much less one without a halo, it was unheard of. The students held all the authority within this city, and to have a complete outsider hold such a tremendous amount of investigative and monetary power within the city was unprecedented. With the president missing, it was incredible that these orders to create such a club were still carried out by the General Student Council. Sensei could have instantly fallen under their suspicion, especially given that the president had disappeared right around the time Sensei had appeared. However, either the president commands tremendous respect from her officers, or her word is quite absolute, because the General Student Council still carried out this incredible request in her absence and seamlessly integrated Sensei into this new extrajudicial club. After filling Sensei in on the chaotic situation, particularly with how none of the General Student Council could access the Sanctum Tower, Sensei was relatively safely escorted to their new chalet headquarters, a gigantic multi-floored building complete with an office, living quarters, a convenience store, and tremendous access to munitions, helicopters, and battle supplies. Sensei might not have much need for such munitions, but in taking leadership of chalet, they have been given jurisdiction to provide supplies to students and academies as they see fit. In addition to the tremendous stockpile within the chalet building, Sensei quickly discovered that the president had left them one more gift, a peculiar tablet called the Shatim Chest. With hazy memories of an ominous password, Sensei was miraculously able to access the tablet and was greeted by the system's AI named Arona, who bore a rather suspiciously similar appearance to the president of Sensei's memories. <laughs> Moving on, after cheerfully checking through the permissions of the Shatim chest, Arona confirmed that the permissions of the Sanctum Tower, the main hub of the General Student Council, and the highest power within all of Kivotos, had been transferred to Sensei through this tablet. Sensei, a complete outsider and rather normal human within this bizarre world, had suddenly become the most powerful entity within all of Kivotos. This was truly unprecedented territory now. With all the power of the General Student Council, Sensei could fundamentally change the laws and power structure of Kivotos. They could raise the Student Council to the ground, transform the political landscape in one fell swoop, become the ultimate authority within Kivotos that could dictate right from wrong. But Sensei did not want this power. The teacher may not know much about this world, or remember what brought them here, but they do know that it would be foolish and unwise to rule over others blindly. Above all else, Sensei strove to be responsible, and assuming authority without more information about this world would be horribly reckless. Part of being responsible is knowing when to delegate responsibilities, and the General Student Council was more up to the task of running Kivotos 
than a single teacher who had just awoken here. Consequently, Sensei instructed Arona to transfer control of the Sanctum Tower back to the General Student Council, who could now begin restoring their systems and regain a semblance of order within the city. Feeling satisfied with their first big decision within Kivotos, Sensei set about organizing their new office and began settling into their responsibilities at Shale. Word of Sensei's appearance and the creation of Shale spread like wildfire throughout Kivotos. The disappearance of the General Student Council president may be somewhat assuaged now that the council had regained control of the Sanctum Tower, but the introduction of a new powerful force within the once sacred circle of academies drew considerable unease and suspicion. The General Student Council officers may have loyally executed the president's orders, but the many individual student councils were not involved in this decision and held Shale with varying levels of caution. The individual students, however, were more eagerly interested in Sensei's arrival, as it presented a new opportunity for many of them to resolve quarrels and conflicts that the General Student Council had previously ignored. Within days, Shale was swimming in requests from students seeking Sensei's extrajudicial investigatory power as well as their access to munitions. Arona noticed that one of these requests came from a surprising source, the crumbling Academy of Abydos, which had long given up on asking for assistance from the General Student Council. The nature of Shale as an independent agency appeared to have piqued the interest of Abydos, and they rather urgently asked for weapons and ammo resupplies. Sensei did not yet know much of Kivotos, but as someone who was helpful to a fault, they were determined to lend their assistance wherever they were needed. In their hazy memories, Sensei recalled the missing president begging Sensei to save Kivotos from its twisted fate. If there was anywhere that would meet a twisted fate, it seemed like the ruinous district of Abydos would be the perfect place to start. Sensei packed their bags, looked over the maps of Kivotos, and headed out to the arid district of Abydos. Many decades ago, Abydos used to be one of the largest, most influential academies within all of Kivotos, hosting thousands of students and residents within its district. As one of the academies near the outskirts of the city, Abydos resided in a desert climate that occasionally saw sandstorms, but was largely considered a pleasant, lively district in which to reside. The Abydos district was even home to a large oasis that rivaled most other lakes in the entire city, and every year the residents would host the Abydos Desert Festival, drawing in huge amounts of visitors from all over Kivotos to celebrate together. It was a bustling academy brimming with influence, power, and prosperity. But within the last few decades, all of this began to crumble away. The descent of Abydos is multifaceted. In addition to desertification, the effects of political friction between Abydos and its contemporaries led to Abydos's complete isolation, and well-timed corporate opportunism stripped almost everything left from the district's dying hands. The encroaching desert was the first to strike. For many years, Abydos had lived a comfortable existence within its arid home. Sandstorms were always a reality living in this part of Kivotos, but they never got to the point where they would threaten the livelihoods of the people living there. But without warning, the sandstorms increased in intensity and frequency. The outskirts of the district began to succumb to desertification, and the sand quickly swallowed up half of the district of Abydos. The term desertification refers to the unnatural destruction of vegetation 
and the aridification of soil due to human activity and climate change. Vegetation serves an important role in protecting regions from encroaching sand. It not only serves as a physical barrier, but it also maintains the water table within the soil, keeping the literal ground from becoming too dry and airborne. If substantial vegetation either dies off or is removed from arid regions, the soil that was once moist and stationary becomes dry and easily moved by the wind, substantially increasing the risk and severity of sandstorms. Based on documentation on Abydos, it did not appear that the actions of the citizens themselves led to destruction of vegetation in the surrounding outskirts. So how did this desertification happen? The prevailing theory blamed climate change within Kivotos, which was certainly a reasonable idea. But the speed at which Abydos succumbed to desertification was still quite surprising. Upon learning this information, it raised some suspicions among the astute sensei, who quietly considered there may be more at play here than climate change alone. Perhaps there was something in the desert that had destroyed the vegetation. But something of that scale would have to be monstrous to cause such widespread damage. For now, the theory of climate change would have to suffice. As the sandstorms ravaged Abydos and more of the academy succumbed to the desert, the Abydos Student Council was quickly running out of money to salvage the homes and buildings within their district. Over the years, they had sent in multiple requests for aid from the General Student Council, but had received ominous silence in response. Abydos's worsening situation was well known amongst the other large academies, who also made no effort to extend help to the rapidly declining academy. Abydos was still one of the largest and most influential academies at this point in time, and the fact that they received no aid from even the General Student Council is rather revealing about the political state of affairs surrounding Abydos. While it could be the case that the General Student Council and other academies felt that assisting Abydos would be too much of a financial liability, the complete lack of a response to requests for aid implies that they stood to benefit from Abydos's descent into ruin. As the most powerful academy in Kivotos, it stands to reason that other large academies, as well as the General Student Council, saw Abydos as a threat to their political influence, and viewed the situation as an opportunity for Abydos to take a few steps down in the hierarchy. Even though the General Student Council was at the top of Kivotos, the rising influence of any one academy seemed to pose a threat to their power, and any opportunity to carefully rebalance the political landscape would be taken. It is unclear if any smaller academies sought to assist Abydos, but the silent dismissal from the General Student Council conveyed that Abydos were truly on their own. With no one else to turn to, and the cost of district repairs rising dramatically, the Abydos Student Council became desperate, turning to the independently owned banks throughout the city. While still subject to Sanctum Tower rules and regulations, these banks were, and still are, operated by the adult underclass, and often conducted business with the students of Kivotos. However, the sum of money requested by the Abydos Council was tremendous, and the banks were reasonably concerned about the Council's ability to ever pay back such a large amount of money. As a result, every subsequent bank turned away the Abido Student Council until there were no choices left. Desperate to save their district and restore the homes and businesses of the people who lived there, the Abido Student Council turned to their final option, the Loan Sharks of Kaiser Corporation. 
As you might recall, robots and animal adults do not hold any representation within Kivotos, but they still comprise a large part of the working population. Putting aside how severely dystopian this is, it should be noted that as long as these adults follow Kivotos laws, they are able to accumulate considerable amounts of affluence within the city, short of holding any actual political power of their own. Kaiser Corporation was, and still is, the largest conglomerate of the adult underclass, with many subsidiaries like Kaiser Construction and Kaiser Loans operating within their organization. After their pleas were ignored by the Sanctum Tower, the Abydos Council was completely out of alternatives. Although legally above board on paper, the considerable size of the Kaiser Corporation had raised quite a few eyebrows within Kivotos, and their loan business was particularly shady. However, the Abydos Council was broke and out of options, and so they turned to Kaiser Loans to assist with the district's financial recovery and plunged the district into unfathomable debt. In the present day, Sensei arrived in Abydos, the first Kivotos official to respond to the school's pleas for aid since desertification had begun. With over half of the city drowning in sand and many of the residents long gone, the earnest teacher quickly lost their sense of direction and became disoriented in the winding downtown streets of the district. Fainting from hunger and unable to contact Abydos Academy, Sensei collapsed from exhaustion, only to be hailed by a student with wolf-like ears and dichromatic pupils. This fateful encounter with the student Shiroko not only ensured Sensei's safe arrival at Abydos, but also convinced the wolf-like student that Shale's leader was earnest, if not rather foolish, <laughs> assuring her that this adult meant Abydos no harm. Literally shouldering the weakened sensei on her back, Shiroko returned to the current base of operations for Abydos, a dilapidated, sandblasted annex of the former sprawling academy. Of the once thousands of students that attended Abydos, the current student enrollment had been reduced to just five students, who no longer referred to themselves as a student council, but instead went by the foreclosure task force. Their president, Hoshino, served as the vice president of Abydos' last student council, and now presided over the remaining students, desperately trying to return their academy to its former glory. The foreclosure task force had taken up the mantle of their predecessors in paying off the tremendous debt of 962,350,000 yen that was owed to Kaiser Loans. The students diligently took up odd jobs and bounties throughout the district, and still were barely able to pay the almost 8 million yen loan interest every month. Unfortunately, this left no room in the budget for ammunition resupplies, making it increasingly difficult to drive off the persistent katakata helmet gang that sought to supplant the Abydos school grounds. However, Sensei's sudden appearance set the wheels of change in motion. Not only had an official actually responded to their requests for aid, but they had brought ammunition and supplies in droves. Newly resupplied and outfitted for battle, the Abydos students engaged with the hostile Katakata Helmet Gang camped out near the school grounds and were finally able to drive them off. The Helmet Gang had been harassing them for months, but with Sensei's assistance, the Foreclosure Task Force finally had the tools they needed to force out these troublemakers from the Abydos District. Resupplied and ready for action, the Task Force launched an assault on the Katakata Helmet Gang's home base and completely decimated it. The Helmet Gang's resources were now significantly reduced, and their base of operations was no more. The task force seemed like they could finally take a breath 
and focus on how to repay the school's tremendous loan. Because of their well-timed aid, Sensei quickly gained the trust of the task force's astute secretary Ayane and the group's emotional pillar Nonomi, as well as cautious approval from President Hoshino. The task force's treasurer Serika, on the other hand, remained highly suspicious of Sensei's arrival. Left to rot by the General Student Council for so many years, Serika saw Sensei as yet another force trying to wrest control from the few remaining Abido students. Hoshino had different reservations. Sensei's modest nature made them seem like less of a threat and more of a liability, but they'd proved useful so far, and so Hoshino saw no harm in keeping them around. However, now that Sensei had seen firsthand how desperate the situation was in Abydos, saving these students from certain disaster had become top priority. Sensei insisted on becoming the advisor for the foreclosure task force, and they would remain in Abydos to help form a plan of attack to overcome the school's colossal debt. These students may have been abandoned by the rest of Kivotos, but Sensei wouldn't leave them to shoulder this burden alone anymore. In a deserted corner of Abydos, the Katakata Helmet Gang brooded over their defeat. The Abydos students were supposed to be easy prey, no competition for the sheer numbers of the gang, and yet their base of operations now lay in shambles. If their employer discovered that they had been unable to drive the foreclosure task force from the school, then the gang might not make it out of Abydos in one piece. The Katakata Helmet Gang were not an aimless group of troublemakers who happened to take root in Abydos. They were muscle for hire, dropouts from various academies who had been tasked with a major job drive the Abido students out of the school annex. The Helmet Gang could break the students' morale by overwhelming force, or simply grind them down until they had no resources to fight back. Either way, the objective was to force the last five Abido students to give up the school grounds. They'd been paid quite well to accomplish this task, but their employer did not take well to failure. After all, when the Kaiser Corporation wanted something, they would do everything in their power to obtain it. The Kaiser Corporation had always been playing the long game with the Abydos district. When the Abydos Student Council had turned to them in desperation, they were more than happy to loan the tremendous funds needed. After all, even if the sandstorms were to subside, the amount loaned was so large that Abydos Academy would still struggle to ever pay it back. The fact that the General Student Council had firmly ignored Abydos's pleas also made it very unlikely that the higher powers in Kivotos would ever bail the school out, further cementing Kaiser's confidence in pursuing the deal. Although Kaiser Corporation was a wealthy entity within Kivotos, this wealth had never given them the ability to buy real power or influence. However, Kaiser knew that money could still be an important bargaining chip, and if they found the right opportunity to utilize it, that could be the gateway to the true power they desired. As things currently stood in Kivotos, the adults who worked here had no real political voice within the system. They were forced to rely on the goodwill of the students who lived here to protect them. But would those students always have their best interests in mind? If you have no seat at the political table of Kivotos, how can you truly guarantee that your needs will always be considered? This is not to say that Kaiser had such an altruistic desire for political power, but the reality of their situation was that no matter how much money they had, they could never tangibly affect Kivotos's governance, and that did not sit well with the corporation's interests. The solution that Kaiser sought was to obtain one of the seats at the Kivotos political table, and when Abydos turned to them for aid, 
they seized the opportunity and waited patiently for the loan repayments to start wearing Abydos down. It took some time, but eventually Abydos was drowning under the weight of their debt, barely able to make the interest payments for their loan. It was then that Kaiser presented them with an offer. If Abydos was able to offer up something of proportional value to their cash payments, then that could be counted towards the loan repayment instead. Of particular interest to Kaiser was the land within the district that belonged to the academy, and they offered this as an option to the desperate Abydos council. With their backs against the wall and the desertification of Abydos still ongoing, the council wearily began to sign away portions of the Abydos district as payments to their debt to Kaiser Corporation. Bit by bit, more and more of the district fell under Kaiser's control until the current day where all that remained under Abydos control was the annex that the foreclosure task force resided in. Kaiser's complete control over Abydos was tantalizingly imminent. But then the unthinkable happened. The Abydos Student Council refused to give them any more land. The last remaining member of the Abydos Council, Takanashi Hoshino, had stubbornly refused any offers of land transfer for almost two years now, and had even assembled a group of like-minded Abydos students to resist the takeover of the district. Kaiser was forced to sit back and hope that the crushing interest payments would drive down Hoshino's resolve, but it never did. In fact, it only seemed to embolden the foreclosure task force in resisting Kaiser's slow takeover of the city. This conflict had even drawn the attention of Kaiser's unsettling benefactor, a man without a discernible face who always wore the same black suit. On multiple occasions, Kaiser's patron attempted to persuade Hoshino to drop out of Abydos in exchange for wiping out most of the school's debt, but the student had rebuffed them at every opportunity. Kaiser Corporation was so tantalizingly close to complete control of Abydos, but Hoshino and her foreclosure task force continued to be the last prickly obstacle to stand in their way. Eliminating the remaining Abydos students, then, had become Kaiser's top priority. The Katakata Helmet Gang seemed perfect for the job. Their rowdy reputation was infamous enough that everyone would think they were working independent of Kaiser, and so tracing their connection back to the corporation would be more difficult to prove. Kaiser's deep pockets had allowed them to develop connections in the black market of Kivotos, making it easier to acquire illegal munitions for the gang to use. Now it was up to the Helmet Gang to finish the job and drive the last five Abydos students from their eroding home. But with their home base destroyed and their ammunition dwindling, the Katakata Helmet Gang began to feel despair creeping in. What would Kaiser do to them if the corporation discovered they had failed in their task? Would they ever be safe to see the light of day in Kivotos if their mission fell through? It was then that inspiration struck. If the Apidos students were too strong to take on as a group, what if they could pick them off one by one? The foreclosure task force was well known for independently working odd jobs to make their debt payments to Kaiser Loans. Surely they could ambush the students one by one as they returned from these jobs. This would be the Helmet Gang's last shot at success. With their remaining forces in tow, they mobilized to the center of town to ambush their first target, the task force's treasurer, Serika. Still distrustful of Sensei and feeling renewed pressure to keep Abydos afloat, Serika diligently worked her evening shift at Shiba Seki Ramen one of the few remaining restaurants within the district. The foreclosure task force and sensei were some of the only customers the entire shift, 
bringing a small bright spot to the day, even if Serika remained suspicious of Sensei's intentions. As the diner closed for the evening and Serika headed back to her residence alone, she suddenly found herself surrounded in one of the more deserted areas of town. The Kata Kata Helmet Gang did not give her time to think. They struck decisively, utilizing their last major weapon to knock Serika unconscious. It takes a considerable amount of firepower to drop a haloed student in this city, but the power of anti-aircraft shells from an illegal Flak 41 were more than enough to knock Serika out. Their mission half completed, the Katakata Helmet Gang threw the Abado student into their truck, speeding off into the desert to dispose of their cat-eared adversary. What the Helmet Gang did not anticipate was how close the Abado students really are, and how swiftly Serika's absence would be noticed. After trying to reach Serika to hang out, Ayane swung by Serika's home to find it empty, with no trace of her cat-eared companion anywhere in sight. Fearing the worst, she immediately contacted Sensei and the remainder of the foreclosure task force to investigate what had happened. Sensing the urgency of the situation, Sensei turned to Arona within the Shatim chest to see if there was any way to pinpoint Serika's location. To Sensei's immense surprise, there was a way to view Serika's last known location. By covertly tapping into the central communication network, of the General Student Council, which held all the cellular data for students across Kivotos's network. Just like the mobile service providers of Sensei's homeland, this central communication network served as a way to provide phone cellular service for the students of Kivotos, but it also held the location information for all the cell phones owned by those same students. If Sensei could access that data, then they could determine the last known location of Serika's phone. And even if that phone was no longer on her, it would give the task force a lead on where she had been taken. Even if Arona no longer had control of the Sanctum Tower, her ability to still tap into some of the systems of the General Student Council was nothing short of incredible. But it was also a dangerous proposition. Utilizing this ability could put Sensei in hot water with the heads of Kivotos, who had granted Shale its legitimacy and power. However, the benefits of accessing the network data vastly outweighed the risks, and at Sensei's insistence, Arona carefully tapped into the communication network. Sensei was not about to let harm befall one of these students, even if Serika remained distrustful of the teacher's presence at their academy. After confirming Serika's last known cellular location, Sensei quickly brought this information back to the foreclosure task force. Much to their surprise, <laughs> the amount of risk that Sensei had shouldered by accessing the Sanctum Tower data, much less remotely with the help of Arona, was genuinely startling. After so many years of silence from the higher powers of Kivotos, someone was not only willing to go above and beyond to help them, but that person was willing to put themselves in considerable danger to do so. Everyone else may have deserted these students, but Sensei was determined to be the exception to that rule. Serika's phone was in the outskirts of Kivotos, and the task force suspected that she had been taken further into the desert from there. Wasting no more time, the task force assembled and raced to the Abydos border to rescue their friend. Slowly beginning to regain consciousness in the darkened trunk, Serika quickly came to realize that she had not only been kidnapped, but that she had no way of escaping the situation on her own. Bound and with no idea where she was, fear began to set in as she thought of a dozen ways the gang could dispose of her including the most probable option of simply burying her in the desert to never be found again. A loud explosion rocked the truck, shaking Serika violently around as the vehicle shuddered to a halt. The relieved shouts of her friends filled her ears as they pulled her out of the truck, confirming to each other that she had been safely secured. Unable to stop herself, tears of relief welled up in Serika's eyes. 
And after a bit of lighthearted teasing from her friends, Serika was reassured that she was safe again, fighting off the remaining Helmet Gang forces. The foreclosure task force reassembled and returned to the school annex that they called home. Upon their return, the foreclosure task force told Serika all about how Sensei broke into the Sanctum Tower's servers to save her, and how they wouldn't have been able to find her so quickly without such a risky maneuver. Stunned, Serika slowly processed this information. Was Sensei truly here <laughs> to help them after all? Had someone from Kivotos really arrived to lend them a helping hand? After so many years abandoned by the General Student Council and the rest of Kivotos, having an adult to rely on came as a welcome surprise. Meanwhile, after being completely and thoroughly defeated by the Abydos Task Force, the Katakata Helmet Gang had finally lost everything. Unable to drive the remaining students from Abydos, even with illegally obtained armaments from Kaiser Corporation, they had now become a liability to their employer. If word spread that Kaiser Corporation was involved with illegal arms dealing, they could draw the attention of the General Student Council, who had turned their attention away from the company's dealings in the past. If the Helmet Gang was unable to give Kaiser Corporation what they truly desired, then they must be silenced and someone else would need to complete this operation. In a secluded corner of Kivotos, the office of Problem Solver 68 received a phone call from the CEO of Kaiser Corporation to offer them a job. Drive the delinquent helmet gang into hiding and dispose of the five remaining Abydos students still within the district. Without hesitation, Problem Solver 68 accepted the offer and made plans for how best to complete this operation. There was just one problem with Problem Solver 68. They were, and still are, a business in name only, comprised of a notorious but ultimately clumsy group of troublemakers from Gehenna. Barely able to afford rent for their extravagant office, Problem Solver 68 was held together by the charisma of their leader Aru and the dedication of her comrades Kayoko, Mutsuki, and Haruka. The group's propensity for flashy explosions and reckless gunfire had earned them a large bounty from Gehenna's militia, the Prefect team, and at the time of Kaiser's phone call, they were still on the run from the Gehenna district. At best, Problem Solver 68 were glorified errand runners, and at worst, they were a ragtag group on the run from Gehenna's martial forces. But for all their flaws, the Problem Solver team did have one talent. They were excellent at keeping up appearances. The fact that this disorganized group of students even received a call from the head of Kaiser is a testament to this fact. Kaiser Corporation is well known for their intelligence network, so for them to fail to discover the true amateur nature of Problem Solver 68 is proof to the group's ability to keep up pretenses. However, their bluff would now stand the biggest test yet, and Problem Solver would need to be sure to complete this job if they wanted to keep food on the table. Low on funds, but high on newfound legitimacy, President Aru spent the remainder of Problem Solver's cash on a group of penny-pinching mercenaries who would only work for a short period of time, but would theoretically be more than enough to take down a group of five students. Now with only 600 yen to their names, Problem Solver 68 mobilized to Abydos, ready to scout the area before their expensive operation would begin. Oblivious to the encroachment of Problem Solver 68, the entirety of the foreclosure task force met in the Abydos Annex to discuss their next plan of attack. Now that everyone was fully on board with Sensei as their confidant and advisor, the Abydos team needed to investigate the illegal armaments wielded by the Katakata Helmet Gang, as well as devise a plan to overcome the debt weighing down their school. 
The ever-diligent Ayane pledged to research where the Helmet Gang received their anti-aircraft weapon, which then left the floor open for proposals into resolving the school's debt. One by one, all the members of the Foreclosure Task Force proposed ideas on how to raise money to pay back Kaiser loans, all of which were shut down by the increasingly impatient Ayane. From multi-level marketing schemes to idle groups, the Foreclosure Task Force's well-intentioned but wildly untenable ideas to wipe out the debt were all shot down. Shiroko even went so far as to suggest robbing a bank in downtown Abydos, presenting the group with masks that she fashioned herself for the operation. This was all shut down at hyperspeed by Ayane. Tensions continued to rise as no tangible solutions were presented, until Ayane completely lost her temper, flipping the table of the task force room with a surprising amount of strength. Quickly realizing their ideas had been rather foolish, the task force decided to take a breather at the Shiba Seki Ramen restaurant, where they treated the worn out Ayane to as much ramen as she could eat. Donning her work uniform, Serika headed over to take her friend's orders as the door of the restaurant slowly opened behind them. Exhausted after scaring off the Helmet Gang forces, Problem Solver 68 rolled into Shiba Seki Ramen, tiredly ordering a single bowl of ramen to split amongst the four of them. Always the brains of the operation, the astute Kayoko immediately recognized the uniforms of the Abido students inside, but after a hushed conversation with Captain Mutsuki, the two decided to keep this observation to themselves. Food came first, they could talk about the Abido students later. However, much to Problem Solver's surprise, the Abido students immediately welcomed them into the restaurant as if they were old friends. After the hard days fighting against the Helmet Gang, the Foreclosure Task Force's guard was considerably lowered, and they were simply happy to share a good meal with like-minded people. Gehenna was one of the largest schools in Kivotos, and if these newcomers liked Abydos enough, maybe they could even convince them to transfer here. Hearing that Problem Solver planned on splitting a single ramen four ways, Serika brought them a heaping bowl that could easily serve the entire group, only charging them for a single serving. Unlike her eagle-eyed comrades, Aru was oblivious to the identity of the task force and excitedly talked with them about the joys of ramen and fighting back against systems of oppression. Mutsuki, Kayoko, and Haruka gradually started to relax finding that they genuinely enjoyed the ramen and the cozy ambiance of the deserted diner. It was a pleasant respite for all parties involved, but it could not last. After parting ways from the restaurant, Problem Solver revealed the hard truth to Aru. The cheerful students who they had shared a meal with were the ones they had been hired to eliminate. Reality had never been kind to Problem Solver 68, but this was becoming their greatest challenge yet. How could they square with attacking the students who had so graciously welcomed them into the district, who had fed them like comrades and greeted them with open arms? However, friendship was difficult to stack against their impending destitution. Even if they ignored the hit to their reputation, if Problem Solver did not complete this job, they wouldn't have anything to their name. They needed money to live, especially with the bounty on their heads from Gehenna's militia that prevented them from returning to the district. Stealing themselves, Problem Solver made their most difficult decision yet. They would still carry out the attack on Abydos, even if it destroyed the perfect friendship that had just started forming. The next day, after bracing themselves against the reality of their situation, Problem Solver 68 made their strike against the Abydos Annex. The goal was to make the assault as quick as possible. If they got this job over with swiftly, then they wouldn't have to spend any extra time in this district 
that was quickly draining away their will to fight. Fighting alongside the mercenaries they had hired, Problem Solver tried to the best of their ability to drive the Abido students from the school. The wrath and betrayal of the foreclosure task force met them in response. The Gehenna students, who they had fed and confided in the day before, had revealed themselves as loathsome enemies, and the Abido students would not be defeated by such treachery. Despite Problem Solver's best efforts, their siege of the Abydos Annex resulted in resounding failure. Try as they might, they could not break through the onslaught of gunfire from Abydos, and before long, it was time for the mercenaries to end their shift. Problem Solver 68 was left in the dust, and the Abydos students were out for blood. Utterly defeated and in danger of fainting, Problem Solver 68 hurriedly withdrew from the battlefield. They would have to find another way to defeat the Abido students before their will to fight them had completely run out. Astonished at the betrayal of the Gehenna students and struggling to understand why they would attack Abydos, the Foreclosure Task Force regrouped in the Annex, where Ayane pulled her research together for them to review. Kaiser had done an excellent job covering up their connection to Problem Solver and the Helmet Gang, but Kaiser had not accounted for Ayane's research into the illegal anti-aircraft weapons, which led her to information on the black market of Kivotos. As anti-aircraft bullets could damage a student enough to knock them unconscious, they were considered contraband weapons in Kivotos. Warfare might be common practice in this city, but the strength of a halo was not limitless, and strong enough firepower could do real damage to a student. Acquiring a weapon like this would be impossible through proper channels, and so Ayane had turned to information about the shifty underbelly of Kivotos, the black market. The existence of such a place may seem odd, but consider that even on a good day, the General Student Council had trouble preventing violence between opposing academies. Keeping a perfect eye on the city at all times would be tremendously difficult, and as a result, the emergence of a black market where gangs could trade was inevitable. For our intrepid foreclosure task force, the existence of anti-aircraft weapons at the black market made it well worth an investigation. But Ayane had one other interesting piece of information. Problem Solver 68 was regularly seen wandering the streets of the black market, causing enough trouble there to be on poor terms with the market guards. With the black market tying both the Helmet Gang and Problem Solver together, the task force determined that their next course of action would be to venture to the black market themselves, bringing them closer to the discovery of Kaiser's involvement in these attacks. For Sensei's safety, they would remain with Ayane back at the Annex, where they could remotely speak with the remaining task force on the ground. With their preparations complete, Chiroko, Serika, Hoshino, and Nonomi made their way into the shady underbelly of Kivotos. Once in the black market, the task force was staggered at how large and sprawling the market was. It became clear that their investigation would be challenging to complete, as it would be difficult to find what they were looking for if they had to cover this much ground. It was easy enough to visually confirm that the anti-aircraft weapons were purchased from here, but without a paper trail, they were unable to determine who ultimately procured the munitions. Disheartened and exhausted from the events of the last few days, the task force was prepared for their investigation to fail, until they bumped into a surprising new face. Abydos may have once been the largest school in Kivotos, but it was never alone in its massive size. The academies of Gehenna and Trinity consistently maintain student bodies large enough to rival Abydos at its greatest heights. Trinity itself had quite the reputation for enrolling the wealthier, more refined students in the city, keeping their troublemaking more on the political stage instead of the battlefield. 
Seeing a Trinity student in the black market would be unthinkable, or so the rumors led the task force to believe. The reality of Trinity's students was quite a different story. For Ajitani Hifumi, being a Trinity student didn't make anyone extraordinary. Even with her good grades and her close ties to the Trinity Student Council, she saw herself as just another ordinary student without any special talents or abilities. What Hifumi did find extraordinary was the fantastical, adorable, oddly philosophical franchise of Momo Friends, particularly their most iconic mascot, Pedro. As someone with low self-esteem, Hifumi saw the characters of Momo Friends as aspirational. Each one of them were unique, talented, and exceedingly adorable. And as the premier Momo Friends otaku of Kibotos, she was determined to own every bit of merchandise she could find. It was only a matter of time before Hifumi's ferocious drive to collect Momo Friends merchandise led her to information on the black market. They housed all sorts of goods that were normally difficult to obtain, so what was to say they wouldn't have limited edition Momo Friends merchandise as well? Visiting the black market would be a dangerous trip, particularly for someone from a notable school like Trinity, but Hifumi always came prepared, over prepared, for any venture. She spent hours poring over forums and testimonials online to gain information about the layout of the market, the mercenaries who guarded it, and any known sightings of Peroro merch within the underground. Throwing on her heavy bag filled with band-aids, provisions, and an umbrella in case of bad weather, Hifumi was ready to hit the streets of the black market. But for all her preparations, Hifumi was not prepared for how quickly a lone Trinity student would be recognized. Hifumi scoured the market and found her prize, a limited edition ice cream Peroro plushie, of which only 100 were ever manufactured. Ever so slowly, students began to gather around her, eyeing the walking piggy bank. All Trinity students were said to be wealthy, so what good fortune would it be to kidnap this one and ransom her for cash? Suddenly seeing the danger that she was in, Hifumi sprinted away from the collectibles stall, trying to find any way to escape from the market's winding streets. She could take down a few students at her best, but with so many pursuing her, she did not have the confidence that she'd be able to drive them off. Plus, even if she could drive them off, the commotion would surely alert the market guards, who could make it so Hifumi would never safely enter the market again. Hifumi turned a corner sharply and ran directly into Shiroko from the foreclosure task force. It didn't take the Apodo students long to piece together what was happening. A lone Trinity student with a plush clutch to her chest had come barreling into them. Pursued by a large group of delinquents shouting to make sure their golden ticket didn't escape. The foreclosure task force took no time to hesitate. Avidos may have been abandoned long ago by Trinity, but they would not let a fellow student be kidnapped right before their eyes. The battle was over almost as quickly as it started. <laughs> the troublemakers were no match for the battle-hardened Avidos task force. Overflowing with relief, Hifumi thanked her newfound allies, who had saved her without a moment's hesitation. She wanted to give something back to assist them, and after learning of their ongoing investigation, she realized that her extensive knowledge of the black market's layout could come in handy. For the first time, Hifumi felt like she was part of something bigger than herself, something where even an ordinary person like her could be of some help. As the task force continued filling in Hifumi on their investigation, they picked up some taiyaki from a nearby vendor to eat as they talked. As they ate their red bean filled treats at the taiyaki stall, Hifumi noticed a peculiar sight. Across the alleyway from them, at the entrance to the black market Stygian bank, 
There was an armored car parked with a recognizable Kaiser representative sitting inside. Hifumi's observation was exactly what the task force had been looking for. The armored truck and Kaiser representative had taken the monthly debt payment from Abydos just that morning. As the group looked on, the Kaiser representative signed off the truck contents, which were then taken inside the black market's largest bank. The appearance of Kaiser Corporation within the black market was too suspicious not to investigate. If payments from Abydos were funding illegal activities, then Kaiser could be held liable for illegal activities in the city. If the task force could find proof of collusion between Kaiser and the black market, then that could be the evidence they needed to finally get the General Student Council involved in their plight. But actually acquiring that paper trail would be tremendously difficult. The only people who would have access to Kaiser Corporation's transactions would be the Stygian bank tellers, all of whom were robot adults working within the building. Impersonating any of the tellers would be close to impossible, and the students would stick out like sore thumbs if they tried to disguise themselves as bank guards. The task force grew quiet as they contemplated their options until they realized the desperate times called for desperate measures. Shiriko pulled out the masks she had made for the task force and announced that the time for bank robbing had finally come. One by one, all the task force members donned their masks, leaving Hifumi in utter bewilderment. With a smile and a shrug, Nonomi carefully cut eye holes into the paper Taiyaki bag and placed it on Hifumi's head. Leaving Hifumi out would be a tremendous liability, but more than anything, the task force was giddy at the prospect of finding the information they had been hunting for, and they wouldn't want to leave their newfound friend out of the fun. Hifumi still had her reservations, but seeing the task force's resolve was enough to sway her to their plot. The masked Mizugi gang was assembled, and they were ready to rob a bank. Meanwhile, within the Stygian bank lobby, a familiar quartet of faces was anxiously awaiting the result of their loan application. Problem Solver 68 was trying to get a loan for more mercenaries from the only bank that didn't have a bounty hanging for Aru's arrest, and their loan pitch was not off to a great start. A shady business license, extravagant office payments, and Problem Solver's lack of any tangible collateral made the prospect of a loan impossible. And after waiting several hours for the verdict, the Stygian bank informed them that they were too high risk to offer a loan. Problem Solver's situation was looking dire. How could they possibly complete this job from Kaiser Corporation if they didn't have any more funds to hire muscle? Their despair was cut short by the power dying in the building and gunshots bouncing off the walls. A group of masked delinquents one of which was wearing a paper bag on her head, <laughs> rolled into the bank, having already defeated the guards at multiple entrances. Their demands were swift and somewhat odd. Give us all your shipping logs and transactions related to the armored truck stationed outside, and we won't have to spray your circuits across the wall. Ever astute, Kayoko and Mutsuki instantly recognized the outfits of the students before them. They had no idea where the foreclosure task force had picked up a Trinity student, but the bank robbers before them were, without a doubt, the students they had failed to eliminate a day before. Ever oblivious, Aru was immediately entranced with the outlandish display before her. Who were these brave outlaws that had done what she could only dream? How did they summon the courage to face down the belly of the Kivotos underground when she could not? The bank tellers brought out a duffel bag filled with documents, and these mysterious outlaws snatched it up, running out of the bank as quickly as they had crashed in. Stunned to her core, Aru only hesitated for a few moments before running after them, hoping to catch some glimpse of the stardom she had just witnessed. 
Mutsuki and Kyoko grabbed Haruka and ran after their earnest but rather foolish commander-in-chief. Meanwhile, with Hifumi's memory of the market guiding them, the intrepid bank robbers made their way back to Abydos, where they could finally take a moment to catch their breath. Hoshino opened up the duffel bag to examine its contents, and in addition to the requested transaction records, she also saw 100 million yen inside. The task force's surprise quickly turned to excitement. They could pay off a tremendous amount of the loan if they were to bring this to Kaiser Corporation. They had only asked for transaction records to prove Kaiser's collusion with the black market, but the bank tellers had accidentally given them this money too. So what was to stop them from using it? However, one member of Abydos firmly stamped this idea down. Hoshino reminded the group that proving Kaiser's collusion was their only tangible option, both to reduce the loan terms and to involve the General Student Council in reining in the corporation. Hifumi agreed, stating that this money had been given to them due to the panicked state of the bank employees. Although they couldn't safely return it, they should think more carefully about what to do now that they had this in their possession. As the group argued over what to do with the money, a familiar form came into focus in the distance. Aru, who had almost caught up, was quickly approaching their location. All members of the masked Mizugi gang quickly donned their masks again, ready to do battle with their problem-solver adversaries only to be greeted with the most fervent fangirling they had ever seen. <laughs> Surprise turned to modest embarrassment as Aru showered them in compliments, insisting that the group's actions had inspired her to become an even grander outlaw. Completely thrown off by Aru's adulation, the masked Mizuki gang began to feel a strange sense of pride in their own actions. They really did just rob a bank, and they had gotten away with it without any damage to their ranks. Even Hoshino began to feel the weight of their actions lifting, and when Aru asked for the masked Mizugi gang's motto, Hoshino confidently told her, An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Forsake mercy and walk the path of chaos. The Abido students had spent so long fighting to keep their district afloat that they had almost forgotten the bliss of being a kid. In this bizarre world where students ran the government, this was the first time they'd been able to feel irresponsible. It had taken robbing a bank to bring back the group's whimsical spirit. Even Ayane, usually impatient with the group's antics, had donned the mask Shiroko had made for her. Kivutos was deeply dysfunctional, and they certainly didn't plan on robbing any other black market banks. But for the moment, they were enjoying the sense of freedom that this experience had given them. However, they felt that they might be pushing their luck with the arrival of the remaining Problem Solver 68 team. So the masked Mizugi gang bid Aru farewell and made their tactical retreat completely forgetting the bag of 100 million yen behind them. In the faraway halls of Gehenna Academy, the senior administrator of the prefect team mulled over the pile of reports on her desk. Word had reached Gehenna that Problem Solver 68 was cited causing a scene in the Abydos district, something that the Gehenna Student Council had once again dumped onto the prefect team to resolve. As Gehenna's formidable school militia, the prefect team prided itself on resolving issues within their district, but Problem Solver 68 had long fled from Gehenna's streets, and Senior Administrator Akko was not about to risk an Abydos invasion just to arrest them. However, Problem Solver 68 was not the primary focus of Akko's attention. Akko was mulling over the report from Gehenna's intelligence network on the formation of Shale, the independent investigatory club that was led by the Haloless outsider to Kivotos. 
the sudden creation of an extrajudicial club associated with the General Student Council was alarming enough on its own, but that it coincided with the disappearance of the General Council President was too suspicious to ignore. Tensions were already high with the quickly approaching Eden Treaty, and Akko would not risk the chance that anything fell through on the day the treaty would be signed. The president of the prefect team, the revered Sorosaki Hina, had made it clear that the Eden Treaty ceremony needed to go off without a hitch, and Akko was not about to let her down. Without a halo, Sensei didn't pose much of a physical threat to anyone in Kivotos, but on a political scale, they were too risky to let wander around the city while their motives remained unknown. Akko had no intentions to hurt Sensei, but detaining them within prefect team custody until the end of the Eden Treaty would be well within her powers. However, subduing Sensei's newfound forces within Abydos may prove somewhat difficult. So in order to detain them, Akko would need to mount a tremendous assault on the Abydos district. This could easily be justified if Akko stated her objective was to bring the problem solver troublemakers into custody. And then her forces could also detain Sensei while they were there. Akko did not have the power to mobilize the prefect team without Hina's approval, but Hina had just left Gehenna on an urgent business trip. As the prefect team's second-in-command, Akko saw this as the perfect chance to get the Gehenna Council off their backs about Problem Solver and take care of Sensei in one swift operation. Akko only hoped that Hina would understand her best intentions when this operation was complete. Back at the Abydos Annex, the masked Mizugi gang reviewed the transaction logs from the bank. Not only were there records that directly linked the Abydos payments to Kaiser's black market account, but that same account also listed recent payments to the Katakata Helmet gang and several questionable munitions contractors. This was the proof they had been looking for. Not only did Kaiser have a huge account in the Stygian bank, but they also paid for illegal armaments and funded attacks on Kivoto students. Getting this information to the General Student Council would be their next priority. As Hifumi headed out from the school grounds, she vowed to bring this information to the Trinity Student Council as well to see what assistance Trinity could offer. Grateful to Hifumi, but skeptical of the Trinity Council's involvement, the foreclosure task force thanked the cheerful girl for her help and made sure she reached the district boundary safely. Trinity may have abandoned Abydos in the past, but with a close friendship now formed with a Trinity Council insider, the foreclosure task force had found a powerful ally to rely upon. While the task force was bidding Hifumi farewell, a chaotic scene began to play out in the deserted Shibaseki restaurant downtown. After the initial surprise at the 100 million yen dropped by the Mizugi gang, Problem Solver 68 was arguing over how to use it to complete their operation. On one side of the argument was Aru, distraught at the newfound knowledge that the masked Mizugi gang was, in fact, the Abydos students. She found herself in a moral dilemma over how attached she'd become to this deserted district. Kayoko and Mutsuki tried to keep their heads about them, assuring Aru that completing this job was still the right decision to make. Haruka, desperate for validation from her beloved comrades, and seeing that this argument was going nowhere, seized the opportunity to give Aru the push she needed to finish the operation and pulled the trigger on explosives placed within the restaurant. News of the explosion traveled quickly to Sensei and the task force, and they raced downtown to find the perpetrators were, once again, Problem Solver 68. Prepared to fight their adversaries once again, the task force reloaded their weapons, 
and immediately had to start dodging mortar shells that were bombarding their location. Confused about who else could possibly be firing at them, problem solver in the task force turned to see the forces of the prefect team bearing down on them. Under normal circumstances, the presence of a school military on foreign district soil would be a direct act of war. However, Akko had double and triple checked the information on Abydos's current jurisdiction, and after confirming that most of Abydos no longer belonged to the school, she felt emboldened to set foot on their territory. The land that belonged to a corporation did not have the political power to rebuff such an act of aggression. Besides, it wasn't the land that Akko desired, but the haloless adult who currently stood upon it. Even so, Akko knew that her assault would have to be swift and decisive. She did not fear the power of the General Student Council to stop her, but she did fear President Hina discovering what she had done and stopping the operation before it was complete. Akko ordered the Prefect team students to move in to arrest Problem Solver 68 and to detain Sensei for transport back to Gehenna. Suddenly finding themselves with a common enemy, Problem Solver and the Foreclosure Task Force could see that their old rivalry would need to come to an end. If they wished to repel the Prefect team forces and protect the teacher who had treated them so kindly, they would need to join forces and fight off their formidable opponent. Setting up their line of attack and shielding Sensei behind them, Problem Solver and the Task Force prepared for battle. Akko sent waves of Prefect team students upon them, ordering the Gehenna students to overpower the Coalition. But the assault was proving more difficult than she had expected. Now that Problem Solver and the Task Force had joined together, they were driving her forces back with tremendous firepower. And with Sensei providing them with ample munitions, the tide of battle seemed like it may turn for the newfound comrades. But Akko did not skimp on her invasion force, and the waves of students just kept coming. The Prefect team was frighteningly serious about detaining Sensei, and the odds of the task force and problem solver fending them off indefinitely was quickly becoming slimmer and slimmer. When all hope seemed to be lost, a surprising figure emerged from a nearby street to stop the invasion in its tracks. President Sorosaki Hina of the Prefect team, who had left Gehenna on an urgent business trip, had just appeared in the streets of Abydos. The significance of this moment cannot be understated. Not only had Hina arrived just in time to stop the detainment of Sensei and Problem Solver 68, but her arrival here signified that the Abydos district had been her business trip all along. Hina was known for many things. Her otherworldly strength and swift decision-making had earned her reputation as a one-woman army. But above all else, she was a powerful negotiator on the Kivotos political stage. Had she not been part of the Prefect team, she could have easily served as the head of Gehenna's student council, a fact of which the Gehenna council was all too aware. Hina had also heard the news that Sensei was working with the Abydos students, but instead of assessing them as a threat, she had swiftly left Gehenna to try and form a new alliance. The fact that Hina had made her way here to introduce herself to Sensei speaks volumes to her forward thinking. Sensei may have seemed like a threat to Akko and many others within Kiwotos, but even before meeting them, Hina had assessed Sensei to be an invaluable asset to Kivotos. Whether this was due to some respect that Hina had for the decision-making of the General Council President, or whether this was simply good intuition, she had already made the assessment that Sensei should not only be trusted, 
but that they should become an important ally to Gehenna's prefect team. However, Hina had made one error in her thinking. She had not informed Akko of her plans. Hina's approach was that if she could make an alliance with Sensei one-on-one, -on -one, it would be easier to sway the rest of the prefect team to accept Shale's assistance. But she had never anticipated that Akko would take such decisive action in her absence. Now, with the invasion ongoing and her plans to form an alliance at stake, Hina would have to bring the hammer down, and she'd have to bring it down hard. With all the venom and rage that a one-woman army can muster, Hina furiously called off the invasion and demanded that all those involved be severely punished for their involvement. Akko and the other members of the prefect team shrank from her fury, sensing that they had drastically misassessed the situation, collecting herself just enough to apologize for the attack, Hina remained behind while her forces retreated to try and mitigate the political damage. Problem Solver 68 seized the opportunity, using the chaos of the moment to make a tactical retreat away from the Prefect team. Her opportunity to meet with Sensei almost squandered, Hina hurried to Sensei with as much confidence as she could muster. She didn't have the time she had hoped to speak with Sensei at length, but Hina felt that she had one more trick up her sleeve that could demonstrate her goodwill. Hina knew that Sensei was trying to aid the crumbling district of Abydos, and assessed that the best chance she had of convincing them that she was an ally was to provide some valuable information to aid their cause. Hina passed along to Sensei that Kaiser Corporation had been sighted in the sand dunes of Abydos's outskirts, digging for something in the ruins. She made it clear that this was information that had not yet been passed along to either Gehenna or Trinity's student councils. Sensei was the first she had informed about this. It was a tremendous amount of goodwill, and combined with her decisive actions to end the invasion, it was more than enough for Sensei to pick up her intentions. Hina bid them a farewell and made her long trek back to Gehenna. Though their encounter was brief, Hina had done enough to demonstrate to Sensei that they had a powerful ally at Gehenna. Now Hina just had to iron out the treacherous creases in her prefect team. Back at their office, Problem Solver 68 counted their lucky stars that they had been able to escape unscathed. But the fight with the prefect team had exposed the truth they had all been trying to deny. No amount of money was worth driving out the Abydos students. Not only did Problem Solver hold huge amounts of respect for the students, but the task force had fought side by side with them, even after the horrible destruction that Problem Solver had caused in their district. Aru, Kayoko, Mutsuki, and Haruka all looked at the duffel bag of 100 million yen still sitting in their office, and they made a decision. They couldn't atone for the damage they had done to their relationship with Abydos. But they could pay for the damages they caused to Shiba Seki Ramen. They may never return to this district again, they told themselves, but at least they could do right by the people who had fed and fought alongside them. In another part of the district, the Foreclosure Task Force reconvened with Sensei back in the annex. With Hina's intervention, the Abydos students felt that the crisis had been averted, but the matter still stood that Gehenna's militia had marched into their district to detain Sensei, perhaps indefinitely. The powerful president of the prefect team may have put a stop to this for now, but it was deathly clear that not all the powers in Kivotos turned a friendly eye to Sensei, as Abydos did. Sensei's hard work and selfless actions had won over the task force's trust, but the teacher's sudden appearance within Kivotos had caused more conflict than anyone had anticipated. 
Akko's swift assault spoke not only to her confidence in Gehenna's military might, but also how she saw the General Council as less of a threat than Sensei. Perhaps the General Student Council of the past was right to fear Abydos Academy's great power, as Gehenna was making it clear that their school did not fear the retribution of the Sanctum Tower. However, Hina had proven to be an unlikely ally, and with Sensei safely retained within the Annex, the Foreclosure Task Force decided it was now time to review the information they had obtained on Kaiser Corporation and the Black Market. Based on the transaction logs from the Stygian Bank, Kaiser Corporation had not only been paying for illegal armaments, but they had directed gangs to attack students of Kivotos, both of which were offenses that the General Student Council would be interested in. On top of this, Kaiser had been procuring large portions of the Abydos district over many years, and it was clear that the corporation wanted complete control over the desertified district. Sensei then volunteered the information they had been told from Hina. Kaiser Corporation was not only trying to take over the district, but they were digging for something in the sand dunes of Abydos. This came as quite the surprise to the Foreclosure Task Force. To their knowledge, nothing besides houses and abandoned businesses laid beneath the sand, so what could Kaiser possibly want in the desert? If Kaiser was up to something beyond what they currently knew, then it seemed like the best course of action would be to investigate further before sending anything to the General Student Council. Once they had determined what Kaiser was doing in the desert, the task force could compile their findings and demand intervention from the Sanctum Tower, the only force with enough power to meaningfully punish Kaiser. At this point, if the Sanctum Tower wouldn't intervene, the task force felt emboldened enough to take on Kaiser themselves, but obtaining official legal assistance from the General Student Council was the preferable outcome. It was time to head out to the Abydos Wastes. Kaiser Corporation's primary objective had always been the acquisition of the Abydos District for one particular reason. It would put Kaiser in a position to create their own academy, the Kaiser Training Academy, and join the political circle of academies that ran this entire city. It didn't have to be Abydos that they targeted, but the desertification of the district was opportune, and Kaiser had seized the chance to slowly take the district over many years. Kaiser may not have halos or the same military might of Kivotos' largest academies, but their acquisition of Abydos land had been technically legitimate, and their right to form an academy upon it would get them the seat at Kivotos' political table that they had long desired. Kaiser's enigmatic patron, the man in the black suit, seemed delighted by the corporation's plans. Even if he'd possessed a face, he would have been a difficult person to read, but his interest in the corporation's plans was quite evident. Even so, the man in the black suit was still an unnerving force. He was a knowledgeable and well-connected patron of the corporation, but Kaiser could never pull up much reliable information on the organization from which the man originated. Gematria. Gematria supposedly had four known members, but their identities and whereabouts were almost impossible to find. All that Kaiser knew was that Gematria had looked favorably upon their organization, and it was best not to look such a gift horse in the mouth. It's unclear if their black-suited patron gave them the information, or if Kaiser found it on their own, but in the midst of obtaining Abydos territory, Kaiser Corporation learned that there was treasure buried somewhere in the desertifying district. The relics of ancient Kivotos were few and far between. Some were said to have the ability to summon entire armies, while others were powerful AI that could disguise themselves as regular people. 
However, all these ancient relics of Kivotos lay dormant within different academy grounds, and the adult underclass of Kivotos could hardly dream of laying their hands upon them. Until now. Abydos was once a tremendous power within Kivotos. It was well within the realm of possibility that they too had possessed a powerful artifact. If Kaiser could find this ancient relic and determine how it could be activated, they could hold the power of the early Halo-bearing students in their palms. The only thing better than gaining a seat at the political table of Kivotos would be the military power to legitimize it, and Kaiser was not about to let this chance slip by. Within the lake bed of the desiccated oasis that once hosted the Abydos Desert Festival, Kaiser spent the last two years carefully excavating, looking for any traces of this artifact. And it was not long before Kaiser Corporation discovered they were not alone. An enormous mechanical monster with a snake-like body and gigantic whale-like flippers was also hunting through the sands of Abydos. It was unclear if the monster, the AI referred to as Bina, was looking for the same artifact, or if it just did not like newcomers to its territory. But either way, this mechanical behemoth made it quickly known that Kaiser would have to fight through it if they wanted to dig anywhere in Abydos. The battles were brutal and frustratingly frequent. Bina's devastating control of the sandy terrain and its ability to tunnel underground made it a difficult adversary, and Kaiser quickly assessed that their fellow robot troops would not be enough to deal with this monster. They would need more firepower if they were to fend off this mechanical behemoth and reach this ancient relic. Kaiser began a quiet but aggressive campaign across Kibotos. Their objective was to hire as many Halo-bearing students as they could to help defend the excavation site. It didn't matter where these students came from. Kaiser hired mercenaries, dropouts, and expelled students to help form the newest branch of the company, the Kaiser Private Military Company. Kaiser had truly reached heights that no other company in Kivotos had before. Not only were they tantalizingly close to owning all of the Abydos district, but now they hosted a tremendous military force of haloed students and adult robot contractors. Once they finally found this artifact, there was the possibility that they could rival the power of the largest academies in Kivotos. And this possibility was simply too tantalizing to the Kaiser CEO. All that was left to obtain the district itself was to drive off the Abydos students. And if the physical force of the Helmet Gang and Problem Solver were not enough to do it, then he would have to take more drastic measures. In the sandy outskirts of Abydos, the foreclosure task force was closing in on the location provided by Hina. It had been some time since any of them had been this far out into the wastes, so it was quite the surprise when the large walls of a military post came into view over the horizon. As they neared the compound, the sand-blasted logo of Kaiser PMC was clearly visible. None of this had been here two years prior when Hoshino had last visited. She recalled that the lake bed before her had served as the catalyst for an argument between her and the last Abydos Student Council president, whose airheaded approach to policy frequently frustrated the young Hoshino. Back in her younger days, Vice President Hoshino had been a deeply distrustful, angry student to be around which contrasted sharply with the carefree demeanor of the last Abydos president. Inspired by visions of an Abydos long past, Hoshino remembered the Abydos president had found an old flyer for the Desert Festival 
excitedly telling the ill-tempered vice president about the student council's plans to revive the Abydos district. Frustrated at this hopelessly idealistic vision, Hoshino had argued with the president, declaring that miracles didn't exist and that the Abydos of the past would never return again. The argument had ended with Hoshino grabbing the Desert Festival flyer and shredding it into pieces. How times had changed since that argument years ago. In the years since the president had left Abydos, Hoshino now had earnest, adorable underclassmen who looked up to her, and returning Abydos to its glory days seemed like a worthwhile, if not impractical, goal to strive for. Hoshino had patched up the old desert festival flyer and hung it within the task force meeting room as a reminder for what Abydos could still become, the memory of which contrasted painfully with the desecrated site before her. Tanks, soldiers, and contracted students marched within the Kaiser garrison walls, kicking up the sand of the oasis riverbed that Hoshino had visited only two years prior. This place had once been the site of Abydos's greatest festival, and now it had been reduced to an excavation site for a group of military contractors. How much more of Abydos had fallen while Hoshino had not been looking? How much more would continue to fall while they desperately tried to pay off the debt? A voice startled the task force team from their observation of the Kaiser compound. A tall, stocky, robotic man strode over to the task force, introducing himself as the CEO of Kaiser Corporation. He had been directly overseeing the Kaiser excavation project, and seeing the task force emerge from the desert had prompted direct intervention. The task force had been a thorn in his side for long enough they had rebuffed the attacks of the Helmet Gang and now Problem Solver 68, the latter of which had frustratingly disappeared into thin air before he could adequately silence them. Now the persistent task force had shown up on the doorstep of Kaiser's great excavation project, no doubt here to cause more delays in their hunt for the Abydos artifact. It seemed like it was time to deal with these Abydos pests once and for all. What the Kaiser CEO had in mind was highly illegal. In fact, it would almost certainly draw the ire of the general student council if they ever caught wind of it. But with how they had ignored Abydos in the past, he felt confident that his next move would face no repercussions. Pulling out his cell phone, the Kaiser CEO made a call and directed Kaiser Loans to demolish the Abydos Academy credit score. For those of you who are mercifully unaware of how credit scores work in and out of Kivotos, they are a horrible invention that ties your ability to take out and pay off a loan to an arbitrary number. If you have a good credit score, you will have an easier time obtaining a loan, and the interest rate on that loan will be considerably lower. Whereas if you have a low credit score, your interest rate will skyrocket, and the probability of ever paying off a loan gets considerably worse. For many years, the Abydos students had been diligently making interest payments every month keeping their credit score stable and preventing those monthly payments from increasing. But by directing his loan officers to illegally tank the school's credit score, the Kaiser CEO had just guaranteed that the interest rate for Abydos would skyrocket, shifting their monthly loan payment from 8 million yen to 91 million yen. The foreclosure task force had barely been able to pay the original loan interest every month, but 91 million yen would be utterly impossible. This action was so thoroughly illegal, it had never been on the table for Kaiser in the past, but the Kaiser CEO had finally given up trying to drive the students away by physical force. Money had been the primary power he had used in the past, he told himself, 
and it would be what finally granted Kaiser the land they had been seeking for many years. The foreclosure task force was completely gutted. After all the evidence they had gathered, there was still a chance they could turn to the General Student Council to investigate, but they had anticipated having months, not weeks, to get the investigation underway. How could they possibly keep Abydos afloat long enough to see justice done to Kaiser, who would already have Abydos in their legal possession by the time the council acted? Sensei was at a loss for how to proceed. The students had worked so hard to save their district, and now for what? Could the student council get involved in time to help them, or would they ignore their requests like they had in the past? The halo teacher had some connections in this city, but it seemed like there were just as many who saw Shale with suspicion. For a moment, Sensei even thought of using their own money to pay off the loan. A desperate thought, but one born of a strong urge to shoulder responsibility for these struggling students. Meanwhile, Hoshino looked at the distraught, hopeless visages of her underclassmen, who she had tried to protect for so many years, and knew the time had come to make a decision. She had relied on the kindness of her friends and sensei for too long, she thought to herself, and now it was time to make the ultimate sacrifice of her own. Abydos may never have a desert festival again, but at least she could preserve what was left of this district for the students who still called it home. Hoshino made the call to Kaiser headquarters. She was finally ready to make a deal. In a darkened office in the underbelly of Kivotos, a man who wore an impeccable black suit had just received the call he had been waiting for. The man in the black suit didn't have a name, but names were necessary for business in this world, and so he took on the one that brought him the most amusement. Black Suit. It was the derogatory name that Takanashi Hoshino had called him the first time he tried to recruit her, and he had grown rather fond of it. It was concise, memorable, and ominous perfect for what Black Suit embodied. Black Suit's interest in Kaiser had been twofold. The corporation was a determined group of adults who sought to insert themselves into the political hierarchy of Kivotos, which furthered Gamatria's own goals. And Kaiser had also forged a coercive monetary relationship with the Abydos Student Council, the vice president of which was of great interest to Black Suit. The members of Gematria may have all been outsiders to Kivotos, but they all wanted the same thing, to utterly overturn the balance of power within this city. If anything, Kaiser's ambition somewhat aligned with Gematria, but they hadn't yet gone far enough. Whereas Kaiser wanted a seat at the political table of Kivotos, Gamatria sought to flip the table completely over. From Gamatria's perspective, the power structure of Kivotos was completely backwards. The students of the city held all the physical and political power, possessing mysterious halos that granted them superhuman abilities. The adults of this world, on the other hand, were relegated to the shadows. They were the powerless underclass, the workers and infrastructure of Kivotos, who had no representation of their own. To Gematria, the power of Kivotos should reside with the adults, not the students, who should never have earned the privilege of such tremendous abilities. In the words of Black Suit, Adults are the ones who should transform society, set rules and laws, designate the norm, and define the boundary between ordinary and extraordinary. Adults should rule the aimless with authority, the ignorant with knowledge, and the weak with power. That this was not occurring in Kivotos was perverse 
and Gematria sought to correct this aberration. It would be wrong to say that this was an altruistic endeavor. Gematria did indeed seek to reverse the roles of students and adults in the society, but they firmly desired to place themselves at the very top. Impatience, however, was not something that Gematria possessed. They were willing to wait many, many years in order for their plans to see fruition, and no options were off the table. They needed to remain carefully in the shadows and explore as many avenues as necessary to achieve their ultimate goal. As a result, Gematria had developed into more of a research group rather than a militaristic one. Black Suit would even go so far as to call the group a team of observers, researchers, and explorers, given how much time they devoted to poking at the fabric of Kivotos's reality. The organization's earliest and grandest experiments were the attempted replication of halos. Referred to by Gamatria as the Sublime, these halos gave the students of the city their legitimacy through the tremendous powers of mystic and terror that they possessed. If Gamatria could learn to harness this power for themselves, the organization would be unstoppable in their plot to overturn the hierarchy of Kivotos. Gamatria even suspected that the unique appearances of the halos were a sign of something greater. With how powerful the halos of this world were, it wasn't out of the question to suspect the intervention of higher powers in their creation. Calling halos the sublime was a reference to this theory. Gematria believed that Kivotos had been created by the hands of gods, and these halos were proof of such. Although ultimately a theory, Gamatria wanted to study these halos and prove if such gods existed. Based on how powerful some students' halos were, it was even within the realm of possibility that some students were direct ancestors, or perhaps even reincarnations, of those same gods that once walked Kivotos. Black Suit was obsessed with this theory, and pursued it with tremendous fervor. If such gods did exist, could the powers of their halos be replicated for the organization to use? This obsession led to the formation of the Absolute Being Autonomous Analysis System, a powerful AI in an abandoned corner of Kivotos, that Gamatria tasked with collecting information on the most powerful students within this city. If this AI could analyze enough information on the students of the city, perhaps it could find a way to replicate their powers for Gamatria to utilize. Years turned into decades, and decades into centuries. The AI had not produced any relevant results, and Gamatria turned to other experiments to attain the power of the sublime. If the AI had spent decades searching information on the entire city, then Black Suit would take the opposite approach and narrow down which students were most likely to be descended from gods. She may have seemed unassuming to the task force, but Takanashi Hoshino was identified as one such student. Her powers were considered to be one of the strongest in all of Kivotos, to the extent that other academies had labeled her as a potential danger in her early school days. Her physical profile also matched the description of a desert god, Horus, the god of the sky. Legend said that Horus was considered a great protector, who held the sun in their right eye and the moon in their left. The heterochromia of Hoshino and the eye-like shape of her halo still could have been coincidental, but it was her choice of weapons that were the most damning. As the protective tank of her group, 
Koshino never left home without her trusty shield, with the lettering Iron Horus across its frame. Whether this was a family heirloom or something Hoshino had written herself did not matter to Black Suit. The evidence was too great to be coincidental. Black Suit was certain that Takanashi Hoshino was a descendant, or perhaps even reincarnation, of one of the ancient gods of Kivotos, and he was determined to experiment on such an entity. For what better material was there to replicate a god than a god itself? Hoshino had finally made the call to sign over her rights as a student in order to reduce most of the Apidos debt. And with this act, Black Suit would finally get the guinea pig he had been hoping for. If she did not produce satisfying results, then Gamatria could move on to other students identified as walking gods such as the Wolf God, but either way, Black Suit's newest experiment was now in motion, and he could not wait to get started. The Foreclosure Task Force found out what Hoshino had done when it was already too late. A heartfelt goodbye letter and her Abydos disenrollment papers were left on the desk of the task force meeting room, leaving the group in utter bewilderment. Without a moment's hesitation, Sensei rushed off to the Kaiser headquarters, determined to get Hoshino back from their clutches. Hoshino may have signed papers to drop out of Abydos, but the papers contained a small section that had to be approved by Sensei. And with this left unsigned, there was still a chance they could rescue her. The four task force members remain behind at the annex, aghast at what lengths their president had gone to in order to save them. Hoshino had been told that if she left Abydos and signed away her rights, she could wipe out most of the debt accrued by the school. And with their school's credit rate now at rock bottom, it seemed like the only solution to save what was still left of the district. But Hoshino, despite her usually shrewd nature, had not seen the deal for what it was. It was the springs of a trap ready to close around the neck of Abydos. As the last remaining member of the Abydos Student Council, Hoshino was the last form of authority that Abydos still had. If the student council served as the government for a school, then having the last representative member resign would leave the position open for the taking. The foreclosure task force could theoretically take it up if they were officially recognized as a club, or Kaiser Corporation could seize it by force. And that was exactly what Kaiser sought to do. They may not have been able to drive away all the Abydos students, but with Hoshino now in the custody of Gamatria, Kaiser felt emboldened to seize the last Abydos holdout. What they were doing was not legal in the slightest. Even if Hoshino had dropped out of Abydos to settle most of the debt, the remaining Abydos students still gave legitimacy to the school and would almost certainly gain emergency powers that could be recognized by the General Student Council. However, the Kaiser CEO had already illegally tanked to the Abydos Academy credit score. He was not about to let the laws of a neglectful Sanctum Tower stop him from taking the last bit of Abydos land. The CEO gathered his forces from the Oasis garrison and laid siege to the Abydos Annex. Frightened, confused, and at a loss for how to proceed, the Abydos students felt like all hope was lost. Even with Sensei's aid and munitions, how would they be able to repel such a large force? And what would be the point of doing so when they could never hope to repay the debt to Kaiser in time? An unexpected explosion rattled the Kaiser forces, and a familiar voice shouted out, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, forsake mercy and walk the path of chaos. With the motto of the masked Mizugi gang as their war cry, the members of Problem Solver 68 emerged from the shadows to defend Abydos alongside the task force. After everything they had been through together, 
Problem Solver had still shown up to help when the task force needed them most, and that was exactly the morale boost they had needed. Fighting side by side in the dilapidated streets of Abydos, Problem Solver 68 and the Foreclosure Task Force ferociously defended the last bastion of the academy that still stood, slowly pushing the Kaiser forces back from the annex. Sensing that the tides of battle had finally changed in their favor, the unlikely allies pressed the offensive on Kaiser PMC and landed their decisive blow right into the body of the Kaiser CEO. His circuits wounded and his soldiers beaten down, the CEO called for a tactical retreat from the annex. He would have to regroup his forces to determine their next line of attack. If they couldn't attack the school head on, then they would have to use their time recovering to determine what they could do next. In a secluded part of the city, Sensei had finally located the office of the man called Black Suit. The man in the black suit greeted the teacher cordially, barely containing his excitement to finally be speaking to the head of Shale in person. The formation of Shale had spread to all corners of Kivotos, even to the ranks of Gematria. As an organization determined to overturn the rule of students in this city, the existence of an adult who held such extrajudicial power was exhilarating. It was completely beyond Gamatria's calculations. Why had the president of the Sanctum Tower invited this teacher here and given them so much influence? Gamatria was somewhat suspicious of the general council's motives, but they could not deny how delightful it was to see an adult finally in charge of something substantial. Maybe Sensei could be the force that overturned the table of power in Kivotos. The prospect was simply delightful. Imagine, the student council had brought an outsider to Kivotos to help them run the city, only for that adult to strip them of power and give it to the rightful owners. The possibility was too good to ignore. And although this meeting seemed like it would end in disagreement, Black Suit was prepared to try again and again to sway Sensei to his side. Predictably, the meeting between Black Suit and Sensei was deathly tense. Sensei had absolutely no interest in working with adults who would abuse their status to rule over students. And try as he might, Black Suit was unable to break the tension with this powerful figure. This city may be deeply dysfunctional and in desperate need of some political restructuring, but the vision that Gematria had for Kivotos was antithetical to Sensei's own. Even as an outsider to Kivotos, Sensei prided themselves on one thing above all else. They firmly believed that the role of an adult was to shoulder the responsibility of making the world a better place for everyone to live. Black Suit was amazed at how easily Sensei could make such a statement. Sensei seemed to be intelligent, so why did they have such a different view of Kivotos from Gamatria? Black Suit demanded to know. Why had Sensei given up the power of the Sanctum Tower? Why had their first action in Kivotos been to give access back to the General Student Council, when Sensei could have used the Shatim Chess to rule over the city? The fact that Black Suit had such intimate knowledge of Sensei's first moments in Kivotos was alarming, and rather informative. Sensei's appearance had such tremendous implications for the city that Gamatria had gone out of their way to learn everything they could about the teacher, and had even gathered information privy only to Sensei, Arona, and the Sanctum Tower. Was Gamatria's intelligence network so good that they could obtain intimate knowledge from the inner workings of the General Council? Or did they have someone on the inside giving them that information? In the moment, none of this mattered to Sensei. 
The only thing the teacher needed was the safe return of Hoshino, and they would stop at nothing to get her back. Sensei even went so far as to offer whatever money Black Suit wanted for her return, but the man in black politely laughed at the proposal. Gematria did not want money. They had more than enough to go around after residing in Kivotos for as long as they had, but the gesture was oddly earnest all the same. Seeing that negotiations had completely broken down, Black Suit relented and saw that pushing Sensei any further would risk the disillusion of a future alliance. It would be risky to directly antagonize Sensei further, and Black Suit mentally acknowledged that the experiment with Hoshino would be coming to an abrupt close. In a sinister gesture of goodwill, Black Suit informed Sensei of where Hoshino was being held and concluded the meeting as cordially as possible. It was an unfortunate development, but trying to win over Sensei was worth losing a godly test subject. For now. Perhaps Black Suit's comrade Maestro had been right after all. Gamatria would never be able to replicate the powers of a god, and they should cease their research into halos in favor of other more promising avenues. After all, Gamatria had recently been informed that their old experiment in the ruins of Kivotos had finally produced some results. Perhaps it was time to revisit the AI that had now proclaimed itself Decagrammaton, and its first prophet, the mechanical monster Bina. With Hoshino's location in hand, Sensei knew that they would need a substantial invasion force to rescue her. She was being held in the old Abydos Academy school grounds, guarded by the entirety of Kaiser PMC. Fighting on the Abydos grounds had been in the students' favor, but they would now be fighting on Kaiser's home turf, and they would need every advantage they could get to break through the waves of soldiers. Sensei may not have a halo, but they were the leader of the independent Federal Investigation Club Shale, and they hadn't spent that time idly. It was time to make good on some of the connections they had forged, and see if they couldn't owe a favor or two to the most powerful forces within Kivotos. Hina had made her position crystal clear. Even if the Prefect team had suspicions of Sensei, she would personally ensure that Sensei had a powerful ally at Gehenna. When she received the plea for aid from Shale, she seized the chance to prove that she and the Prefect team would serve as valuable comrades. Gathering the highest ranking members of the Prefect team, Hina informed them that this would be their opportunity to make up for their treacherous actions and skip the remaining thousand pages of apologies they'd been writing for days. Ako, Iori, and Shinatsu all heartily agreed, and the four most powerful members of the Gehenna Militia made their way to the sand dunes of Abydos. With members of the most powerful militia in Kivotos now en route, Sensei had one last academy to petition, the formidable Trinity Academy. Sensei had never personally met the student council at Trinity, but knew someone who had and they promptly made the call to Hifumi for assistance. As opposed to the student councils of many other academies, Trinity governed their school by a council of three equally powerful presidents. The Tea Party, as this council was called, prided itself on having a more democratic governance. <laughs> when Hifumi had come to them several days prior with information on the illegal arms dealings of Kaiser Corporation, the Trinity Council had unanimously agreed on the danger that Kaiser posed. The corporation had been cited trying to recruit students for their PMC within Trinity's district, and the Tea Party had been mulling over how best to approach the situation. It was at this moment that Hifumi returned to the Tea Party with a proposal. The students of Abydos would be engaging with the military base of Kaiser to rescue their comrade and Trinity could lend some aid to ensure that Kaiser's military ambitions were firmly stamped out. 
Nagisa. One of the Tea Party presidents readily agreed and helped to ensure that Hifumi could assist with their powerful L-118 howitzer weaponry. Even if the Tea Party had never formally met Sensei, it didn't hurt for Shali to owe them a favor, and making an important political alliance here seemed in their best interest. Gehenna and Trinity may have been wary of Shale, but the Tea Party would not make the same mistake that the Prefect team had. As the newly outfitted Hifumi raced off to join her Abydos comrades, the Tea Party had one more form of assistance up their sleeve. They had reached out to the General Student Council with an urgent message that required the Sanctum Tower's intervention. According to the intelligence Trinity had been given, Kaiser Corporation had illegally purchased and distributed contraband weapons from the black market, and had even gone so far as to kidnap the Vice President of the Abydos Council. Trinity didn't have any information on Gamatria, so Kaiser was the only thing in the report, but they felt it would be more than enough to get the Sanctum Tower to act. The collapsing Abydos of the past may not have been able to gain the General Council's aid, but Trinity was a thriving, formidable force in current-day Kivotos, and they would ensure that their appeal would be answered. Abydos and Sensei really would be in their debt once this was all over. The forces of Kaiser PMC stood around idly, guarding their garrison and the Gamatria research lab as they had been instructed. With the whole army now assembled in one place, they wouldn't be defeated as easily as they had been at the Abydos Annex. Or so they mistakenly believed. Explosions rocked their forces from multiple directions. To the north, three students from Gehenna were laying waste to their army, headed by a frightening student who dispatched their troops like it was child's play. To the west, they were bombarded by shells from a devastating howitzer, driven by a mysterious student with the codename Faust, who wore a paper Taiyaki bag on her head. And then to the south came the combined forces of Sensei, the Foreclosure Task Force, and Problem Solver 68. With righteous fury and determination, they carved through the PMC forces and made their way to the old Abido school grounds where Hoshino was being held. Some of the most powerful students of Gehenna, Trinity, and Abydos had come together to fight a common foe, and as they bore down on the garrison, the Kaiser forces buckled under the assault. Robot soldiers collapsed from their injuries, and haloed mercenaries fainted from the sheer onslaught of bullets. Kaiser PMC had been completely and utterly overpowered by the assault. Problem Solver 68 split off from the task force to hold off the CEO and his elite forces, keeping them distracted while Sensei and the Abido students raced to the abandoned school grounds. Inside, the task force dispatched the remaining guards and began blasting down the door of the chamber where Hoshino was held. Hoshino sat in the center of the chamber, restrained from moving with ominous equipment monitoring her every movement. The task force cut away the restraints and pulled her limp body to the helicopter waiting for them outside. But how? Hoshino stammered in disbelief, seeing that the garrison had been thoroughly bombarded around them. Her dependable underclassmen smiled back at her, knowing that she already knew the answer. They had gone through hell and back to save her, and they would not be leaving her side. I'm home. Hoshino smiled at them, jumping into the arms of her tearful friends. The Kaiser forces decimated and their garrison ransacked, the operation was successfully completed. Sensei may not have arrived in Kivutos in time to save more of the district, but with the help of the Prefect team, the Tea Party, and Problem Solver 68, they had ensured Kaiser would not be operating at full capacity for quite some time. 
The pressure that Trinity had placed on the General Student Council had ensured that Kaiser was being investigated for criminal dealings in the black market, and their CEO had a warrant out for his arrest. The credit score of Abydos Academy was returned to its correct number. In the chaos of the assault, Gamatria had slithered back into hiding, Black Suit's office now empty and bereft of clues to his whereabouts. With Sensei's assistance, Hoshino was able to successfully re-enroll in Abydos, and the Foreclosure Task Force officially registered themselves as the new Student Council of Abydos. With the agreement between Hoshino and Black Suit nullified, their debt had unfortunately returned to its original amount, but now that the Sanctum Tower was investigating Kaiser, Sensei felt assured that they would not try to force their hand again. News of Abydos' battle in the desert and Sensei's involvement with their resolution spread like wildfire across Kivotos, and requests for aid once again were pouring into the chalet desk. Sensei had proven to be an invaluable asset in resolving conflict in the city, and the powers within Kivotos had taken notice. The requests from the student councils of Trinity, Millennium, and Hyakiyako had already appeared on their desk, and Sensei knew that their work in this strange city had only just begun. They weren't sure yet if they would be able to avert this twisted fate that the General Council President had spoken about, but Sensei would do everything in their power to try. The curtains close on our story for today, but please stay tuned for our next chapter on the signing of the Eden Treaty and the chaos that was about to unfold. Thank you for spending time with me and learning about the tribulations faced at Abydos. I hope that this has helped to bring together all the events that occurred within the desertifying city and the forces trying to seize power within Kivotos. If there are any developments to this story, I'll address them in the comments below or in another chapter centered on Abydos. But as of the time of writing, this is everything we know about the once magnificent district in the desert of Kivotos. All the research for this video was compiled from countless hours of playing and replaying the story of Blue Archive, as well as reading forums online to see different perspectives on the game. If you're looking for more information on the similarities between the world of Kivotos and mythology in our world, I would highly recommend the many Reddit posts of users UTilk17, I apologize if that's not how you say your name, and U-Genpre, who both have spent extensive time examining the mythical inspirations for much of the cast. This particular video essay of mine focused less on the historical similarities between Kivotos and our world, so if you're interested in that, they both address that at length and are a really interesting read. Thank you to everyone who has made it this far. I hope this was a worthwhile look into the world of Kivotos. I had a ton of fun making this, so I hope it was as much fun to listen to as it was for me to write. Please look forward to more Lore Archive videos in the future as we explore the vast world of Blue Archive. <laughs>